my water just broke. I felt like things really intensified. She was right there and she was coming. It was, it was an amazing feeling. I'm gonna cry just thinking about it. I could feel her head. We heard her cry. We were squeezing hands and she was screaming. <laughs> I'm Bryn Hunt Palmer and you're listening to The Birth Hour. This podcast is designed as a safe place for women to come together to share their childbirth stories. Stick around and join us to hear informative and empowering birth journeys from women all over the world. Today's episode is sponsored by Babylist. The people at Babylist believe that you should be able to get exactly what you need for your unique and growing family. That's why their baby registry easily lets you add any item from any store. Plus, Babylist helps you each step of the way with their customized checklist, product guides, and reviews. And their personal registry consultants are there for you whenever you need. They've even got group gifting. Start your registry today to be eligible for a free Hello Baby box of goodies for baby worth over $100 while boxes last. At the end of this episode, I'll be talking to Sarah about her experience using Babylist. If you're new to the birth hour, you may not know that we have a Patreon group. This is where listener supporters can pledge $5 or more a month to help support the birth hour and its mission. If the birth hour has added to your life in some way, we would love for you to consider supporting us by going to patreon.com slash birth hour. All of our listener supporters have access to bonus content, as well as an exclusive Facebook group created just for you. The members of that group are so amazing and the support we give one another there has had such an impact on my life and I know it has for so many others who find our group to be a safe place to ask questions, share concerns, and get genuine and loving feedback from those who have been where they are or are going through something similar. We also do regular Zoom calls in there as well. So again, if you head over to patreon.com slash birth hour, you can get started and show your support for the birth hour. I will link to that right in the podcast app show notes as well. And you'll be able to see all the different perks you get at the different levels, including our co-producer level, which is $10 a month and comes with access to our second podcast, the partner podcast, where my husband interviews partners about their perspective on pregnancy, birth, and postpartum. That podcast comes out every single Friday for our co-producers via Patreon. So again, head over to patreon.com slash birth hour, and we would love to have your support. Today's birth story guest is Mabel, who is sharing about having a vaginal birth after having multiple fibroids removed from within her uterine wall. Hi, Mabel. Welcome to the birth hour. Thanks for being here today. Thank you, Bryn. How are you? I'm good. Can you start by telling listeners a little bit about you and your family? Sure. Um, my name is Mabel Bashran. I live in Northern Virginia with my husband and my son. Um, my husband, Tim, works for the government, and I am an education specialist for the local school county. And um, I have a five-month-old baby boy. His name is Simi. Great. And I know we want to hear a little bit about um, your journey to becoming pregnant. So let's start with that. Sure. So my husband and I got married um, back in 2013. And um, we decided upon, after getting married, we decided that we wanted to wait a year before um, we tried to get pregnant. And so um, a year came and went. And actually, um, he got a job offer to work for the government. And upon doing so, he had to go through an elaborate medical uh, review because there was an opportunity to travel abroad. And so he went for his medical physical and I had to go for one as well. And when I went for my physical, um, the report came back that I was extremely anemic, which I had already had some idea that I was anemic, but the doctor made it seem as if like she was shocked that I was still walking and talking because my blood count was really low. And she suggested that I go see a gynecologist to see what exactly would have caused me to be so anemic. So upon going to um, my OB, um, I found out that I had several fibroids. And um, it really shocked me that I had fibroids because I'm African-American and a lot of my um, friends, especially their moms and aunts, all had fibroids, but they were all considerably older. So I was a bit puzzled as to why I would have um, fibroids at such a young age. I was extremely unaware about what fibroids were and how they worked. And so she did give me the option to um, what they call watch and wait. You know, she said they weren't too big, but they were at a point where they could be problematic, but it shouldn't impede on my um, TTC journey. 
So my husband and I decided to just um, watch and wait, and hopefully I would get pregnant before they were problematic. And if I did have to attend to them, we would do so later. So we began to um, try to get pregnant after that report. And at the same time, I had um, one of my good girlfriends had gotten pregnant and she had fibroids too. So we were both looking at each other like, hey, this is, we're in this together. But um, her case was quite extreme. It, it, it left her bedridden for her entire pregnancy. She was in and out of the hospital all the time. And seeing her go through that made me feel like, I didn't, I didn't want that for myself if I was to become pregnant and I still had the fibroids. So my husband and I sat down and talked about it and um, I decided to um, go in for a myomectomy, which is um, the removal of a fibroid. And my doctor said that um, I was a good candidate for what is called a laparoscopic myomectomy, and that is um, essentially a robotic procedure. Um, there are two types of myomectomies. There's one that's abdominal, which is akin to having a C-section. They cut you um, just as they would if you were having a C-section, and they will take it out. And usually that's for like really big fibroids or multiple fibroids. Um, I had about maybe five detectable fibroids, and they were ranging between three centimeters to 10 centimeters. And my doctor said that um, if I wanted to give it a shot, she can try for the laparoscopic myomectomy. And I like the idea of the laparoscopic myomectomy because um, the recovery time was quicker and it was less invasive than an abdominal uh, myomectomy. And so um, we decided to go with that. <laughs> And so I was scheduled for my myo in June of 2016, and they removed about seven fibroids, although they detected five. When they went in, they realized there were more. And so they were able to successfully remove them. Um, they did leave a couple in my uterus because they were just too small to um, operate on. And so the hope was that they wouldn't be an issue Thankfully, all of them were, they weren't inside the uterine cavity. They were within the walls or outside the uterine cavity. So it wasn't as if the fibroids were imposing on any chance of getting pregnant. But, you know, if they were gone, hopefully the option or my chance of getting pregnant would be higher. So um, my recovery from the myomectomy was very smooth. Um, after two weeks, I was back at work. I just feel very fortunate that I had a really good procedure done and um, I was able to just resume with my normal activity shortly after. Um, and my husband and I decided to wait a little longer so that I would um, heal as com as completely as possible. Um, usually after such a procedure, they would suggest that you resume trying to conceive about three months after your procedure, but my husband and I decided to wait about six months. I just really wanted as high of a chance of getting pregnant as possible. And then also, um, I felt that the longer that I would wait would give my uterus a chance to heal. And so that if I wanted to have a vaginal delivery in the future, I would have a greater chance to do so. So I had the surgery in June and we resumed um, trying in December of the same year. And I would say we were actively trying to get pregnant come December. I feel like before we weren't really paying attention to cycles and ovulation and, and so forth. But when we gave ourselves the green light, I was very much aware as to you know, temping and OPKs and scheduling. I had an app that I was using actively. And so I was, I was very much aware of the, of the process then before. Nothing happened after we started trying um, as detailed and organized I was in my pursuit. It just just wasn't wasn't happening. So I decided to go see an RE and he we did everything. I they checked me, they checked him and they insisted that everything was fine. Even little fibroids that were left weren't problematic at all. And they just kept saying, you know, just keep trying. And so we kept trying and we went back a few months later and I was like, am I doing something wrong? Is there anything that we can do to help out with this? Um, 
and my doctor said that we could try Clomid. He didn't feel as if I needed to, but I was like, okay, I'll give it a shot. And I did. I was on Clomid for about two months. And I, I would say for me, the side effects were really wonky. I was extremely moody. I had hot flashes all the time. I was extremely, uh, I don't know, I just felt like really, really emotional when I was on Clomid. And um, after two months of trying it, I was like, this is not for me. I I don't want to do this anymore. So we got off Clomid. My doctor offered for us to try timed intercourse. And um, at that point, I after the Clomid, I was just like, I don't want to go through the medical cycle. I just felt like maybe if I gave myself time, it would happen. But at the same time, I was just very confused. Like maybe this is the route that I have to take. And so we agreed to the time intercourse and they sent all the medication to my house. But when it got here, I just couldn't do it. Like I just took them all out of the box. I read everything. I sat down and, and I, I just didn't feel like it was for me. So what I did is I just put it in the fridge. Um, I put the progesterone in the, the, I guess it's the syringe in the fridge. I think they had to stay refrigerated. And I just said, okay, I'll give myself a few more months. I know I have all the directions. I have all the, the, the tools and meds in front of me. If we don't get pregnant, then I'll try the timed intercourse. At this point, my RE just left it up to me and my husband. He didn't provide any more counsel, or at least we didn't seek his counsel. But um, I wasn't ready to to do the timed intercourse, but I held on to it just in case. So um, all of this is happening. I guess I should say this is the year 2017. we went on with trying to get pregnant. Nothing was happening. And finally, I told my husband, I was like, hey, if we don't get pregnant by December, at the end of the year, December 2017, we'll go back to the RE and we will talk about not just the time intercourse, but we'll talk about maybe IUI or IVF. And my husband was extremely supportive. He was quite relaxed about the whole thing. I was the one who was anxious, but he was like, you know, it's whatever. I believe we're going to get pregnant. You know, just continue to pray and be hopeful. But um, he agreed. He's like, okay, if that's what you want, we'll do that. So November 2017 comes. I get my cycle. And I'm like, okay, I have one more month to get pregnant. At this point, I kind of resolved in my mind that we were going to have to go the medicated route. And by that time, I was okay with it. But uh, November came and went, December came, got my period, and I was like, okay, this is my last chance to try. My husband and I, you know, we, we gave it our shot, <laughs> and, um, and I just had to wait. I, I feel like sometimes for women who are really anxious about trying to get pregnant, we're always like online or in the forums and group chats with other women listening and reading what worked for them, what didn't work. And I remember... Um, you know, after being online and reading stuff over and over again, I just was like, okay, we we really tried this month. Let me take a pregnancy test and see what happens if I get a very, very, very faint line or something. And I tried a pregnancy test just to see. This was like maybe like a week after um, I had ovulated and I had nothing, nothing came up on the pregnancy stick. And I was like, okay, it's over. Like, we're just going to start with a new year, new me, new baby. And I let it go. And so my period was due at the very end of December. I had very short cycles. And um, the day that I was expecting it to come, it didn't come. Um, and for me, I was like, okay, I'll give it a day because, you know, I may have timed things wrong. Maybe I was, I was off a day or two. So I waited another day and nothing came. I didn't even feel as if my period was going to come. And something deep down inside told me like, girl, you are pregnant. (laughs) You are pregnant. And another part of me was just like, this is too crazy. It's just, it just can't be. And so another day came and went, my period didn't come. And I was very scared. I was very nervous to take the test because I was like, maybe my body is playing tricks on me. Or maybe I really am pregnant, but I can't believe it after all this time. Mind you, it had been maybe three years after uh, we had gotten married and I had never had a positive test. And so finally, 
I went to the store, I bought the test and um, I didn't take it right away. Of course, I scoured the internet researching about like, is it possible for you to miss your period, but you're not pregnant? Or is it possible for you to get, I mean, I was just searching for random stuff trying to confirm for me, but obviously the best confirmation would have been the pregnancy test. So um, on December 31st, I was getting ready to go to church. My husband and I, um, we, we go to church every 31st night of the year and I was like, okay, before I go to church, I'm going to just take this test and see. It's been a few days. And I hadn't told my husband that I had missed my period. But I'm pretty sure he knew. Guys seem to know your period better than you do sometimes. But um, I took the test. And I tell you, before the indicator got, the urine got to the main part of the indicator, it was bright, two bright lines. And I just looked at it and I was like, well, of course you're pregnant. You've missed your period for a few days. You've been trying so hard. Of course you're pregnant. And I mean, I I had pictured in my mind how I would, would react upon looking at a positive test. But for me, it was just kind of like a sense of relief and just gratefulness. Um, it was also very symbolic for me to have ended the year with a positive test, especially after all that we had gone through and especially after um, planning to go the IVF route in the end, we just felt like it was God's favor in our lives to, to have that experience at the very last day of the year. So um, I told my husband, he was really excited and it was just this little secret we had in our, our hearts and we kept it to ourselves for, for uh, we planned to keep it to ourselves for a few weeks um, before we told our family and friends, but it was it was just a mixture of shock and excitement to finally be pregnant. I bet it was a long journey and probably a lot of stuff you hadn't anticipated. Absolutely, it was it was um, it was a lot. I would even say, and I I forgot to mention this that um, after all those years of trying and having the fibroids and having the surgery, I got really deep into an interest about birth and pregnancy and labor and delivery, I went for my um, training to become a doula, not just for myself, but to support my friends and family and then also other women when it came to learning more about their bodies and what to expect during pregnancy and beyond. And then also just to help other women um, advocate for themselves um, when it came to having the birth that they desired. So how did your pregnancy go once you found out you were expecting? Yes. So we found out on December 31st and um, I immediately called my OB because of my history of fibroids and the surgery to let them know. And they wanted me to come right in so that I can do um, the HCG test and um, some other things. They wanted to make sure it wasn't an ectopic pregnancy. And so I went in, saw the doctor. And there wasn't much that they could do. It was so early. So they had told me to come back two weeks later um, for another test. Um, that would have been around six six weeks pregnant. Um, in between the time I had first uh, met with my doctor and then the time in which they wanted me to come back, um, I had a scare of some sorts. I went to the bathroom one evening and I just had bright red blood in my underwear. I tried to remain calm, but I told my husband I wanted to go to the ER just to make sure everything was okay. And in the back of my mind, I was like, yeah, this happens, you know, such a high rate of uh, miscarriage um, in the early weeks. And so a part of me was just really disheartened. And another part of me was just like, no, I cannot lose this baby. Um, We get to the ER and for some reason it was so packed and I couldn't see anyone for almost, it felt like almost an hour, an hour and a half. And at that time, we hadn't told anybody, but my mother worked at the hospital in which I was going to. So she called me just randomly just to say hi. And I just broke down and I told her, I was like, mom, I'm at the hospital. I'm at the ER. I haven't seen anybody. And, you know, I had to tell her I was pregnant. That wasn't the way I wanted to tell my mom, but I just ended up just telling her everything. And she came straight to the ER um, I don't know what she did. She went to the front. She spoke to somebody. And I, I tell you, two minutes later, I was in the back getting, you know, getting looked at. And so it was me, my mom, my husband, 
and I went to the restroom to give them a urine test and I had a huge blood clot just pass out of me. Like it was, it was huge. It was like the size of two fists put together. And I was like, well, there it goes. Like there goes my pregnancy. And I wasn't angry or upset. I was really like just numb. And I came out the bathroom and I just looked at my husband. I just shook my head. I was like, this is, let's just, this is stupid. Let's just go home. Um, so we went home and I spent that evening and the next day just wallowing in my pity. I, I, I could have sworn I had lost the baby. And so I went to the doctor the day after next. And, um, I just told him what happened. I was like, you know, this is what happened in the ER the day before. And, you know, just do what you got to do to let me know that the baby has passed and I can just move on with trying again. So my doctor just, she just get, looked at me so strangely. She's like, well, what makes you so sure that the blood clot was the baby? And I was like, it was the baby. I just know. And she's like, okay, let's just do an ultrasound. All right. And, you know, I lay down and she puts the little goop on me and she um, puts the wand on my belly and brand girl, there was a heartbeat. There was a baby. And I just looked at the screen like, what the hell came out of me anyway? <laughs> I was just like, what is going on? Like, it was so bizarre. Like, I had made up in my mind that it was a miscarriage. And then I'm looking at the screen and there is a little blob with, you know, its, it's heart is pulsing. And I look at the doctor and I'm like, you've got to be freaking kidding me. I'm still pregnant. She's like, yeah, girl, you are very pregnant. And I, I just laid back on that, on that little, you know, bed of sorts, whatever it's called. And, and I, I resolved at that moment, I resolved, I was like, I'm not going to worry about this baby ever again. I'm not going to worry about this pregnancy. Like it was truly by the grace of God that I got pregnant and I cannot let any minor thing that happens, um, take away my joy and my excitement. And so at that moment, when I saw the heartbeat, I was like, come what may, I'm going to press through this pregnancy. I know that um, God is in control. I know that this is meant to be. And so um, after that, that test, I just relaxed. I forced myself to relax and just, and just carry through. And so that was really the only, you know, scare I had. Um, with the pregnancy, I would say overall, it was, it was an amazing pregnancy. Granted, I had a little bit of nausea in the first trimester, but come 12 weeks, I was back to myself. Um, I had, I had always, I had been on a weight loss journey before getting pregnant. So I was already very physically active, um, beforehand. And I continued with my workouts to the best of my ability and with my doctor's permission, um, and I felt great. I felt wonderful. Um, my friends and my family, once we told them, they were just like beyond excited. Like we had so many people in our corner really praying for us and rooting for us and hoping for a child for us. So when I finally was able to share that news with them, it was just as if, you know, it was like Jesus was coming back or something. It was <laughs> people were just so happy and so um, grateful that their prayers were answered. So I had a lot of positive energy um, going on in my my home and in my church community and beyond. Um, I even, we even traveled. We took a long trip to Bali. My girlfriend was celebrating her birth, birthday and we had bought tickets before finding out we were pregnant. So we just continued with our plans and I went to Bali and had a wonderful time there. I know that you know, there's a scare of Zika and everything. And I'll be honest, I was a bit nervous, but I just, you know, stayed covered and used my repellent and I was just fine. Um, I will say around week 24, I began to experience some excruciating pain in my lower abdomen. And after reading so much online, I thought it was round ligament pain. I called my doctor and the nurse on call, she I described it to her and she's like, yeah, it must be round like lig uh, ligament pain, but it just wouldn't let up. It was getting worse day by day and came to a point where I couldn't walk. I couldn't move. And, um, finally I had my husband carry me to the doctor and my doctor was like, actually, it's not round ligament pain. One of your fibroids 
are degenerating and there wasn't anything they could do about it. Um, fibroid degeneration is just when it begins to break down in your uterus. And for some women, it's problematic. For other women, it's not. And for me, it was just extremely painful. It lasted for about a week. And then I feel like just one day it was gone. The pain was gone. For for a minute, I I thought I had made up the pain in my head because it came and went so quickly. But um, that was the only time I had issues with my fibroid. And um, I was at home for about a week. And then afterwards, I was back to to my daily routine. Around week 28, I went in for my GD test and I was positive. Um, I had gestational diabetes. And um, I was kind of upset because I felt I was very misinformed about what GD was, even with what I've read about it. I didn't fully understand it. I was kind of bummed because I just felt like, you know, I had a healthy lifestyle. I shouldn't have GD and then I had it. Um, so I had to go on a diet to control my blood sugar um, for the remainder of the pregnancy. It wasn't fun at all. I didn't like doing it, but whatever I had to do for the baby, I just pulled through. Thankfully, I my one of my very close girlfriends was pregnant as well. And she coincidentally had GD. So we were both, you know, moping about it together. And it just seemed a bit easier going through, through that part of my pregnancy with a friend, especially if she had the same issue. But, um, it, I would say the bonus of having GD was that it helped me regulate my weight gain and stay very in tune with my body. I will mention this because I feel like this is important for how my birth story went is that um, upon having the myomectomy, uh, after I had the surgery, I sought high and low for a doctor who would support me in having a vaginal birth in spite of my uh, fibroid history. I I did not want to to be succumbed to having a C-section just because I had um, the fibroid removal. And I had read numerous medical reports and articles that said that um, a vaginal birth after laparoscopic myomectomy was possible if the uterine cavity was not entered and if the patient was treated as a VBAC patient. And my uterine cavity was not entered upon reading my report. So I felt that I could have a vaginal birth if I had the right team behind me. And I... I want to say I I probably talked to 10 different doctors in the Northern Virginia, D.C., Maryland area to see if they would take me as their candidate. And almost all of them said no. They said that um, they weren't comfortable with it. Um, In spite of what my report said, they said that I would have to have a C-section if they took me on as their patient. And so finally, I found a doctor um, who was willing to do it. I will say his name. His name is Dr. John Gonzalez. And he looked at my report and he talked to the doctor who did my surgery. And he said, you know what, let's let's give it a chance. I think you can do it. And he was extremely supportive of me pursuing having a vaginal birth. But unfortunately, he passed away. Um, I was pregnant. I was in my almost done with my second trimester and he passed away unexpectedly. And I was devastated, not because that I lost my doctor, but I was just devastated for the fact that he he died the way he did. And um, so many women, he helped so many women with having wonderful births. I had brought so many of my girlfriends to him because of what a great doctor he was. And then he was gone. And so I had to either stick with my practice or find a new practice. And um, with the push of my doula, she she suggested that I find a new practice. Um, and I just didn't know how possible it was going to be for me to find um, a doctor or a midwife who would take me as a patient so late in my pregnancy and also with my medical history. But I eventually switched over to, um, they're called Centerville OBGYN. I switched over to them at 35 weeks and um, there are two midwives and two OBs in the practice. I believe they may have a few more, but I saw um, two OBs and I saw two midwives and I explained everything to them. And they were very honest and said that they had never had a candidate like me in their practice. 
And they said if they did have a candidate who had um, a myomectomy, um, they would suggest a C-section. But they also said that they were trying to reduce their C-section rates in their practice and that they would give me a chance. And so I was extremely grateful that they took me so late in my pregnancy and they were willing to give me a chance um, to labor on my own. Um, Towards the end of my pregnancy, I had high blood pressure, so I was put on bed rest. Um, They said that if I wanted to have a vaginal birth, I could not be induced and that I would have to go into labor spontaneously. Um, And they were willing to let me go up to 41 weeks um, as well without any talking of inductions. I was very, very happy about that. Um, I, I owe my birth story to this practice and the midwives there were um, working with me and giving me a chance in spite of my medical history. I love that you used like all of your resources to make that decision. And then it sounds like you kind of just went with your instincts as well. Yes, um, I, I did. I, it's amazing how, um, you know, especially with, with going into the doula world, how we talk about women having to advocate for themselves. And it came to a point where I had to advocate for myself. And even then I was very nervous and at times I just wanted to give up. But I feel that the fact that I pushed through and I kept a straight face and I came with my folder with all my notes and all my medical articles. I'm not a doctor, but I had all the the medical journals to support my cause and they worked with me. And I just feel like it was it was meant to be. All right. Well, I am ready to hear all about your birth story. Yes. So I opted um, for a few membrane sweeps to help get things started, especially since I wasn't going to be induced. I just wanted to try to get things going because I wasn't sure if I was going to make it um, to the cutoff time that they proposed. So um, at week 39, I went in for a membrane sweep. It was uncomfortable, but um, I did it. And I got a little crampy, but nothing really seemed to happen. Um, Around that same time was um, a wedding of one of my dear girlfriends. And so I was really looking forward to going to the wedding and just dancing my ass off so that hopefully I could induce labor. I, I went to the wedding. I danced all night. Nothing happened, but it was a good time anyway. So I just used the last few weeks of my pregnancy to just rest and um, walk a lot and um, just get ready to deliver. I um, got a pregnancy massage around 40 weeks and five days. Um, The masseuse was also a doula and she came to my house and she she took very good care of me. I had never had a massage like that. Um, And we talked at length about um, what to expect for the delivery. Um, she showed me how to do a few belly lifts, which were a bit uncomfortable, but hopefully that would allow him to settle into my pelvis, um, and, you know, just be ready to give birth. Um, I did a lot of walking. I experienced a lot of Braxton Hicks and yet nothing happened. Um, but I will say my knowledge of birth just kept me very observant, Every day I was paying very close attention to my body. And um, one night, the night before I went into labor, I was feeling very uncomfortable in our bed. So I told my husband I was going to go downstairs and sleep on the couch. Um, And I did that. And I woke up around 2 a.m. that morning. And my Braxton Hicks seemed very regular. They weren't painful, but they just seemed to be coming at a regular time. And I was like, all right, girl, this is it. I just knew that I was going to get it, going to be in labor or I was experiencing early labor. And so around 6 a.m. when my husband came downstairs, I told him, I was like, you could go to work and then I can call you to come back or you could stay home. It's up to you. But I feel like today is the day. And he said he will go. Um, to work and that I should call him. Um, I had also had a membrane sweep planned for that day anyway. So my mother-in-law was going to come and take me to the doctor. Um, But by eight o'clock, nine o'clock, I was like, I'm not going to the doctor. I'm going to the hospital today. And um, I called my husband. I told him to come back. He came back home 
And around the time he came back home, my mother-in-law pulled up as well. And um, I, I told him that I, I, I didn't, you know, that he should call my mother-in-law and tell her that, you know, I canceled my appointments so that we can kind of give myself a chance to labor at home by, you know, by myself without interruption. But I guess that phone call never happened. So I ended up laboring at home with my husband and my mother-in-law present. My poor mother-in-law, she she didn't know my plans um, to have an unmedicated birth. So she was a bit puzzled as to why I didn't go to the hospital at the first contraction. But she was very um, kind and quiet as I labored by myself. My doula couldn't make it to my house because she was with another patient. So she sent her backup doula and an additional doula to shadow. So I had two doulas in the house, my mother and my husband. Um, And my doulas were amazing. Kathy and Jamie, they um, walked with me. They helped me do belly lifts. Um, We um, were going up and down the stairs. I was in the tub. I labored in the shower. Um, I did everything to kind of keep things going. We called the hospital several times, but they were actually booked. There were no rooms in triage. There were no rooms in labor and delivery. So I had to stay at home and labor on my own anyway. Um, and this, I was at home for, you know, I would say if, if I really started paying attention to my contractions, it was around 8 a.m. And, um, the time that we decided to go to the hospital was around 4 p.m. So I was at home for a while and um, I had one contraction that was back to back and it was extremely painful. And I was like, no, we got to go. So we packed up everything. We we headed out to the hospital. And by then, triage was um, not as b- busy. And um, we get there and my mother meets us at the hospital as well. My mother is a nurse. And, um, you know, when you go into triage, you're only allowed to go in with your spouse. But I don't know. My mom just kind of walked into triage with her nurse badge. No one really questioned her as to what she was doing. And she just walks into this hospital as if she works there. And I turn around and my mom is there. And I say all this to say because, um, I, I personally just wanted to go through this with my husband and my doulas. My my family, um, they could be quite, uh, they could hover. <laughs> and so I just didn't want to have too many people around hovering and, and bothering me as I was trying to have a peaceful labor. But my mother-in-law and my mom were there and it was fine overall, but it did... Um, kind of changed the mood for me. Um, Upon getting to the hospital, they checked me in and I I checked in at five centimeters. And so I was very, very um, confident that I was going to be able to have the unmedicated birth that I wanted. I had a great team behind me. Um, Everyone was very supportive and encouraging. And I just felt ready to do this. Um, I had to stay monitored because of my GD. And I, the hospital that I was at, they had wireless monitors, but they didn't really know how to work it. So in the end, I was hooked to the monitor, um, which kind of, kind of sucked because I didn't get a chance to, you know, labor in the tub like I wanted to. But um, they tried to make things as comfortable for me. I used the peanut ball. Um, my midwife was really, really awesome. She let me disconnect from the monitors for about 20 minutes every hour to go and labor in the shower. And that helped. Um, and we did this all night. I was, I was just, I feel like I was just a gangster. Man, I was just going so hard in the, in the labor and delivery room. I was just pushing through and just, you know, just taking every contraction to the best of my ability. They did check me a couple of times in the midst of my labor um, and I did not want to know the number. I just wanted to know if I was progressing. And they told me I was progressing, so we continued to push through. And um, I will say, if I got to the hospital at 4 p.m. at 5 centimeters, by midnight, they checked me and they said that, you know, you're at 9 centimeters. Um, you know, we can you can start to push or, you know, you can start getting yourself prepared 
to push. And by nine centimeters, I was in excruciating pain. Um, the contractions just seemed to shift for me. At first, they were they were bearable. They weren't fun, but they were bearable. But by that that nine centimeter mark, it was like something was taking over. And I I I was assuming, okay, maybe I'm getting into transition, but they were unbearable. So I asked for um, the laughing gas. The hospital had the laughing gas, and they brought it. And um, I just couldn't keep the contraction on my face to inhale um, the, the, the solution, whatever it is. Um, it just, and when I was inhaling, it just didn't seem like it was doing anything for me. I feel like, um, the gas just made me extremely delirious. I, I felt very out of it, almost drugged (laughs) to an extent. And, um, my husband would tease me and say, like, I was just muttering things that were, that just made no sense. And so um, eventually I just told him to, to take the gas away from me. And by that time, I feel like not only was I loopy, I was also still in extreme pain. Um, and I was extremely aware of the pain that I was in. And so my midwife said that if she pushed my cervix back, um, she would be able to get the baby in a certain position for me to push. The only way she can do that is if she she had to move my cervix while I was having a contraction. So I gave her a chance to do that. And just the fact that she was inserting her hands in me while I was having a contraction that was already somewhat unbearable for me was just too much. And I said, no, no, this has got to stop. At that point, I was like nine and a half centimeters. And I just told my husband, I was like, this is it, man. I've, I've been here since four p.m. the day before. It's now 4 a.m. I I have I have to give it up. And so um I got the epidural. And I personally would say I I I don't want to say I felt defeated, but I just felt like I just didn't understand why I had to get an epidural so late in the labor. I was just barely there and I had to give in for the epidural um, because I just couldn't go anymore. I had been laboring all day, all night And I just didn't have any more strength in me. But um, upon getting that epidural, I understand why I got it. And it was because I needed to rest. And that's exactly what I did. I swear, I probably was falling asleep while they were putting the epidural in. And um, next thing I know, I was out for maybe five or six hours. I woke up and I was just like a brand new person. I was like, let's do it. I felt extremely relieved. I felt very energetic and very ready for the pushing process. And of course, by then I was um, at 10 centimeters and ready to go. And so um, my doula showed me different ways to to push. Um, I will say even at that time, I could still, still feel all of my contractions. So my midwife was like, I can push whenever I'm ready to push. And that's what I did. I, I was pushing for about two hours. Um, my contractions had slowed down considerably at that point. But um, I pushed for about two hours and he was born at 1.23 p.m. It was amazing, Bryn. I will say that he came out, he wasn't crying, but I, I, I assume I was crying for the two of us. I was beyond hysterical with joy. Like, <laughs> and I remember my, the, fir- the, first, the first thing I said is like, I can't believe I did it. Like, I, re- I remember just saying, I can't believe I did it. Like... I can't believe not only that I was pregnant and and had labored, but I can't believe I pushed him out of me. And I felt everything, even with the epidural. I feel like at that point it had worn off, ex- excess, you know, it had worn off. Um, and I just was, I think I could have fallen out the bed with how hysterical I was. I was sobbing and just overcome with emotion. My eyes were like so blurry with tears. I couldn't see anything. And it was just an amazing moment for me. Just like after the the past five years, having had gone through everything that I went through, I finally had my child and I had the birth that I wanted. Um, and I was just extremely grateful. So, um, I cried for myself. I cried for him. And eventually he started crying and I, and I was able to kind of just like 
you know, relax and sit back and just like kind of take it all in. My midwife prompted me to, um, to be, to begin pushing for my, uh, placenta to be delivered. And, um, I pushed a few times and my placenta came out. And then right after it came out, I remember looking to my husband and I'm like blinking I'm blinking excessively because, you know, I'm thinking, oh, maybe my eyes are still, you know, teary from crying so hard. And I was trying to wipe my eyes. I was trying to blink and I couldn't see clearly. Everything was really blurry. And I was telling my husband, I was like, I really, I can't see anything. He's like, well, what are you talking about? I was like, I don't know. And I keep rubbing my eyes and then I just like close them and I put my head back on the pillow and I try to open them again. And not only were my eyes still blurry, I felt very dizzy. And so I'm like trying to look in the direction of my um, midwife. And I told her, I was like, Chloe, I don't feel so good. And she's looking at me and she looks down and I, I kind of like try to pull myself up to kind of see what's going on in between my legs. And I feel like, you know, we both kind of looked at each other. My midwife, Chloe looked at me and I looked at her and she kind of brings her hands up and her hands were just, like soaked with blood. It was as if like it was a murder scene or like a horror film, like her, her arms and her wrists and her hands were just completely bloody. And I, I turned to my husband and he looks back. He tries to poke down where my, you know, where, you know, in between my legs. And he looks at me and he's like, are you okay? And I'm like, no, I'm not okay. And I slowly close my eyes and at that point, I don't remember much of what happened, but from what my husband and my midwife and Obi told me was that I began to hemorrhage excessively. And she was very grateful that I told her I didn't feel so well when I did because, you know, um, that's when the hemorrhage began. And she was so busy attending to other things, she didn't really see it right away. But my husband said that it was like someone was just pouring out bottles of water, bottles of water, bottles of blood from in between my leg. He said, that's how, how much was pouring out. It was just burning out of me. And, um, eventually, um, a team was called in immediately to come and handle things. And after an hour, they got everything under control. Um, I did have to get a transfusion. I got two bags of blood, um, and my OB and midwife worked together to help stop the bleeding they put a balloon inside my uterus to kind of press against the walls of my uterus to stop the bleeding from wherever it was coming from because they weren't sure where it was coming from. It started when I delivered the placenta, but it wasn't necessarily um, from that site. So um, the balloon was placed in there and had to stay in there for 48 hours um, to make sure the, the bleeding stopped. So that was something I wasn't expecting and it was quite scary, but, um, thankfully we had a team that worked, um, quickly to help assist in that. Um, my OB later on told me that it could have just been from the fact that I had a long, a very long labor. It could also be from the fact that I had a big baby, my son, was born at nine pounds, six ounces, which I was not expecting at all. I mean, granted GD, they say for women who have GD, they may have big babies, but I did not expect to have a nine pounder. And, um, she also said that it could be from complications of my surgery or the fibroids, but all the same, um, they did a great job to help stop things from, from getting out of control And, um, once they took care of me, I was then able to, you know, hold my baby and get to know him and bond with him. I do remember hearing him crying a lot in the background when all the chaos was happening. My doula and my husband were switching between, you know, holding him and trying to console him. But finally I just told them, I was like, Hey, just put him on my chest. I can't hold him, but if you put him on my chest, maybe he'll stop. And they put him on my chest and he stopped immediately. He stopped crying and he just kind of just rested on my chest. And it was just a beautiful moment for me and for him to just kind of relax and enjoy each other, even though there was a lot of drama going on in the room. So, um, yeah, that's, 
that's <laughs> the story. Um, wow. And um, I'm, I'm glad I survived. Yeah, that's a lot. So how was your recovery after losing so much blood? Yeah, so um, I had, like I said, I got two bags of blood with the transfusion. And um, I, I will say my recovery was just fine. I was supposed to keep the balloon inserted for 48 hours. But after 24 hours, my doctor came in and checked. She said everything seemed fine and they removed it. And once they removed it, I didn't have any more bleeding. I was able to um, breastfeed. Um, he latched immediately and I didn't have any issues with that. Um, I think it may have taken a little longer for my milk to come in, but um, the colostrum was sufficient for him, of course, at that at that stage. And um, I went home within the time period that I was supposed to, and I I just recovered. I I bounced back very quickly um, in terms of my health, and um, I didn't have any issues at all. I didn't tear either that which I thought was crazy after pushing for so long um, and having such a big baby I didn't tear at all so I wasn't in much pain um, if any upon getting home so I just feel like everything was just it was just a very fortunate experience for me well from everything that you went through so many different like experiences and facets to your story but what are your favorite resources that you recommend to people I love Mama Natural from YouTube and I have her book and um that was a, a pleasure to read through um throughout my pregnancy I used her videos and her website and her um book a lot as a reference point um I also Loved the Birth Partner by Penny Simpkins. I used that in my doula training, and I referenced that a lot. Even though I had a doula and my husband was there, I just loved reading that book to get myself ready. Um, I mentioned that I had researched a number of medical articles on fibroids and VBALM, vaginal birth after laparoscopic myomectomy. Um, if if I can, I can pull up the ones that I used yeah, um, if you want as to a send reference. Them to me, I'll I link studied, them in the show notes. Yeah, absolutely. I use that a lot to kind of just educate myself about my surgery and also educate myself about the possibility of having a vaginal birth. And I had a vaginal birth, so um, it is possible. I also um, read a lot about gestational diabetes. I joined a lot of groups on Facebook regarding GD and also regarding um, breastfeeding. And um, this, there's this one book that I used a lot in my trying to conceive journey called Supernatural Childbirth by Jackie Mize. Um, it helped me um, prepare myself emotionally and spiritually for getting pregnant and um, um, staying positive throughout my pregnancy. And so um, those were my core resources um, throughout the past few years in getting ready for um, becoming a mother. I will also say that uh, um, just, you know, using Baby Center and other, you know, mo uh, popular apps on my phone were helpful in knowing how the baby was growing and such. Yeah, those are super fun. <laughs> All right. Well, do you want to share where people can find you to connect online? Yeah. Um, so I am active on Instagram. Um, my name is Mabe the Babe. <laughs> um, and I can, I can share that with you. I'm also starting um, to um, pursue um, helping women um, in pregnancy and pursuing my doula business. And that is called Within Her Birth. Um, I'm on Instagram with that handle as well. I'm not so active on it just yet, but if people want to find me in regards to uh, my personal life or in regards to my doula life, they can find me at both handles. Perfect. We'll link to all of those. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you. And Brent, if you don't mind me just saying this final thing, um, as an African-American woman and knowing what the statistics are when it comes to maternal mortality, um, I felt that my story was very important for other women, especially Black women, to know that 
they can stand up for their rights and they can stand up for their desires and that they should not give up when it comes to having the birth that they want and having the, um, the experience that they feel they deserve when it comes to pregnancy and delivery. And um, I know that when I was researching about having a vaginal birth online, there were very slim to none um, stories about women who had um, a vaginal birth after a myomectomy. And then I know when I was going door to door finding a doctor, it was extremely difficult. And I almost gave up, but I was very fortunate to find someone who would support me. So I do believe that you can have what you desire when it comes to your birth, but you must persevere and you must do your research and you must ask questions. And if you're not getting the response that you feel that you deserve from a certain practice, it's okay to find somebody else. And um, I, I just feel very blessed and fortunate to have gone through what I've gone through, even though I had a scare post delivery, I think having the right team and having the right um, practice um, behind me made everything possible and made everything successful. And so I, I just believe that the birth hour, and I should have mentioned this, the birth hour was another resource for me when it came to um, listening uh, to other women's stories and just being inspired and encouraged by what other women have gone through. Um, in regards to having the the desire that they wanted when it came to birth. And I think that it can be the same for all women, especially Black women, in spite of what's going on in this country and how the odds may look against us. I think that um, just hearing more and more stories about women who are having successes um, when it comes to delivery will kind of inspire them to just push through when it comes to having what they want. So I would I would like to say thank you for for the work that you've done because it's helped me in just staying positive and pushing through even though I didn't get what I wanted initially I got what I wanted in the end. Thank you so much for sharing that and yeah. um, and for bringing up the you know racial disparities in childbirth. We covered that on a past episode. I just looked it up, episode two thirty three, with Deneen Milner, who shared her experience mm-hmm. as well as mm-hmm. you know some of the pro yes. publica um, coverage on the topic. And so I'm glad that you brought that up. And always am trying to Absolutely. share more and more stories that address those things. Right. I remember Deneen's story, too, and I listened to that several times. So um, I think it's 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 great that uh, women of all backgrounds are are sharing their story, regardless of the outcome. It's important that we we hear from each other and use that as a personal reference. Definitely. Well, thank you so much again, Mabel. I really appreciate you sharing your story with us. Thank you, Bren. You have a great one. Now I'm going to chat with Sarah about Babylist, today's sponsor. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for coming on the podcast today to chat with me about Babylist. Hi, Bryn. Thanks for having me. Can you tell listeners just a little bit about you? Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Sarah Rainwater. I'm my husband and my two kids, and I live in Prescott, Arizona. We just had our second baby. He's seven weeks old, so I'm pretty fresh on all the baby products. We're small business owners, or I don't like the term small business. We're we're self-employed. We're business owners. So anyways, we're fairly busy folks and having two little ones under two, they're only 18 months apart. It definitely makes us grateful for products like baby list when it comes to planning, you know, like a low key baby shower, like we did with our second. So anyways, I mean, just kind of busy folks, but, but definitely enjoying the parenthood aspect of things as well. So did you use Babylist with your first or just started this time with your second? So I used it with my first, but I used it kind of in a much more low-key way. Um, I feel like with my second, it was much more our prominent uh, registry that we used. And so with our second, you know, I didn't register for all the typical firstborn stuff. Like we had nothing with our firstborn and with our second, it was much more targeted to where we needed something from this store or something from that store or, you know, like our, um, our newborn photos, 
or things like that. So we definitely used it much more prominently with our second baby. Yeah, it's so great for adding all those things that aren't traditional baby registry items. That's definitely what I've been using it for this third time around. Yeah, absolutely. And it's funny because um, I feel like it's just gaining more and more popularity with that. Like even my aunts and my mom, they're just, you know, they're telling everybody about the cool thing that I use for my registry. So like, I think it says in some of your guys' ads, like you can register for dog walks and anyways, so it, it is very much, um, awesome in that area or, you know, register for home cooked meals. And so what we used it for, for things that weren't store bought items was like I said, the, the newborn photos and my maternity photos. And we were able to get both of those, which was really awesome. Cause that's just, you know, an expense that you want to have because you want to have those, um, those photos for the rest of your life. But when you're not registering for, you know, booger suckers, it's easy to register for, for photos and somebody can give you something that you're going to hold on to for the rest of your life. So those are bigger ticket items. Did you have like a grandparent gift you those or did people go in together on them? So I had a couple people and some of my friends go in together on them. And um, I think it made it really, really doable for, for that as well. Yeah, that's so fun. What a like priceless gift to give. I know it is. It really is. Did you mostly use the app or do it on your computer? Um, so I definitely mostly use the app and, um, I am a little bit of a controlly type person. So I also like to see when somebody, you know, got me something that, so it will tell you like something's been chosen off your registry and that way I could, uh, kind of keep inventory, I guess, of what, you know, was coming my way before the little shower barbecue that we had. And then I could, get the rest of the things that I didn't have. So that was another feature that I liked. Um, I made it to where it wouldn't tell me like who bought me it, but I knew when an item was coming. So that's another feature that I liked a lot on the app. And so that's what we, we normally used. Yeah. I like that. It just says like reserved, um, yeah. <laughs> without giving away who gave it for those of us who can't, uh, keep surprises at all. <laughs> <laughs> Except for my father-in-law, he reserved an item or I don't, maybe he bought it. And, but it like, it kind of took a while to come. Cause of course it was, then it was through the actual items website. And I called him and I was like, did you, I'm like, I don't mean to be rude, but did you actually get me this? Or he was like, no, it's coming. I'm like, okay, because if you didn't, I wanted to buy it. So um, anyways, it was kind of, it was a good way to to just keep track of the items that you're getting because we really needed all these items. But like, they weren't, like I said, you know, a blue onesies, like we had all that. We needed the items that were on our registry. Awesome. Well, I'm glad it worked out for you. Thanks for sharing a little bit about it. Yeah, thanks for having us. Thank you so much again to Mabel for coming on and sharing her birth story and to Sarah for chatting with me about baby list. If you want information from today's episode, just head over to thebirthhour.com and find the show notes page. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, head to thebirthhour.com and click become a member to pledge your support. And as a thank you, you'll get an invitation to join our private Facebook group and access to exclusive episodes. Your vote of confidence and support means the world to me.